Hey everybody, today we are going to be talking about the role of data science within game studios and more specifically, one, what is the role of data science within the game studio? Two, what are the primary applications data science is used for? Three, what does a data science team look like in terms of structure and team size? Four, how do you hire the data science team? Five, the biggest mistakes made with data science teams? And six, the future of data science in game studios? And here with me to talk through all these issues is Andre Cohen, head of data science at mobile games publisher, Tilting Point. Welcome, Andre. Hey, hey, Joe. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little while since we last met, but yeah, it's really great to see you uh, on video and really yep. great to reconnect. Absolutely. So I thought, um, I thought, Andre, we could go ahead and start just by establishing who you are and why you are actually a really great person to be talking about data science in game studios. So maybe we can start there in terms of like, you know, your background and, and career in data science and gaming as well. And before you start, just want to let the audience know how we met. So previously when I was at Sega and then NBC Universal as a working in games publishing, you know, I had the opportunity to meet with a lot of different vendors, a lot of different tools providers, and you at that time started this company, Gondola. And I have to say that you guys were really impressive in terms of just the thoughtfulness of your solutions, just how well you guys understood the various problems and the technology that you guys had. So just wanted to say that, you know, from that, from that moment that we met, uh, I was definitely very impressed with you guys. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, that meeting was was like a lot of, oh, I, we had a lot of practice before we got to, to <laughs> knock on Sega's door. Uh, and, and you didn't hear, you didn't see the, the, the before, uh, only the after. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, right? So data science, I have to be really clear, didn't exist when I went to school. Um, that, that's a new thing. That's a, that's a hipster, San Francisco, Uber, Airbnb, Facebook kind of thing. Um, I actually went to, to a PhD in computer science. Um, I was doing machine learning. My, my goal was always just to be a professor, you know, nice cushy job. Uh, and I realized halfway down through my PhD that I never had the access to funding and I never would be able to be, to see how it gets done, right? Like, how do you get money? Because at the end of the day, uh, when I went to school, that was the time when it became obvious that professors were getting their own funds like a startup having their labs and doing their research and it wasn't just free money being coming in it was really a, a business so and one summer i ran out of money like a lot of phd students run out of money or they don't find uh, the funds to continue working and uh, i met nicholas the the guy from gondola my co co-founder and he had a game and he was working on this game on his own and it needed a developer just to remove like, what was it, like AdMob from the game and put Mopub in. Like really early, like this is iPhone 1, right? This is, there is no freemium. There is no in-app purchase. This is hardcore 99 cents uh, uh, game. So I did that for the summer. Uh, I, I never worked really with an iPhone, but it, well, how hard could it be to work with phones? It, it worked out pretty well. Um, and at that point I realized, you know what, I, I want to work on a startup. This is a, this is a hot market. Uh, freemium had just been announced, like the concept of an in-app purchase by Apple. This was right. like, it was like, uh, the beginning of a gold, gold rush. And Nicholas and I joined forces and we started making a game from scratch. Uh, and I think this is where I, a lot of, I learned a lot about the industry and maybe how I was able to relate to you at Sega was making a game from scratch. I'm talking about no Unity at the time, right? There is no, there is nothing. Uh, so I did all of it um, from coding the game engine to talking to the graphics guy, getting the audio into the game, uh, connecting all the different SDKs at the time, like uh, OpenFaint, whatever it became later uh game center um and and analytics there was this concept that you might just want to track your players and and understand their behavior like there was nothing there was no game analytics at the time so built it from scratch uh this whole back end to, for the for the game there's also this concept of like wow wouldn't it be great to do an a b test in a game 
So <laughs> there I go, coding this thing, like completely blind to what else is happening, right? This is completely right. done in New York, just the two of us, me and Nicholas. And as you would expect with a lot of people, uh, that freemium game we made never really took off. Um, at the time, Rogue, was it, uh, yeah, uh, Angry Birds had come out with this like great publicity story, like how Angry Birds took 10 games to hit success, right? And so Nicholas and I looked at each other like, well, some basic data science tells us that we're, this is our second game. Yeah, eight more to go. <laughs> so we, we cut it short. Uh, we cut it short the game making, but we figured out that, you know, A-B tests what did work. And we doubled our revenue in our game by just tweaking numbers in the game, literally numbers in a JSON file. And so that sparked our imagination to pursue this data science route, to change from being a game company to being a service provider. Um, and that's seven years ago. Um, and we started by just focusing on analytics with the idea that, hey, maybe if we give people data, they will make decisions. Took two years to figure out that's not a good idea because data by itself is, there's this concept of like, is it actionable data, right? Uh, then we took two more years to, you know, exploring uh, dynamic pricing. This is how you met us, dynamic pricing right, yeah. for games. Yep. We realized that that itself is not good for every game or applies for every game. And then we took another two years to figure out, you know, there's live ops optimization. The whole player journey is an optimization in itself. And there's bigger things you can do. And that's the story. Uh, we got acquired by Tilting Point, and now we're talking. Great. So just talking, like, starting with the role of data science, could you elaborate a little bit more of that in terms of, like, you know, on the general level, what is the mission or the primary objective of data science, or what should it be within game science, uh, in, within game studios? And just to actually kind of keep it real for a minute here, I will say that in my own experience, just like at a lot of companies, they're like the higher up you go in terms of like executive level, they're, they're all saying, yes, we need data science. Data science is so important. But then when exactly. you ask them like, what does data science do? They literally have no idea what the data science guys are actually working on. So it'd be great to, to kind of clear that up for, for, for everybody, especially if you're a high level exec out there, you should listen up now. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, I've seen this. And here's the deal. They're not completely wrong. So broadly speaking, data science, to me, what it means is we are basically exploiting data in search of making money. Uh, we, there's the belief that you know, data is, is, has, there's money to be made with the data. Uh, there's insights that you can learn from it. Um, you can make decisions for your business based on data. That's not an old, that's an old concept. Nothing's changed. Um, I think so much so that I would argue that you know, in a big publisher, if you make revenues from in-app purchases, ad, ad monetization, right? I would argue data science is the third pillar. Like that's how you make money. Um, and so that's how big of a chunk of your revenue it could potentially be. Right. Um, now, the problem is like, as you're saying with keeping it real and, and you know, the confusion is that people think that, oh man, we're not making money. Th those first two pillars not working out data science, let's get the third pillar in, they'll, they'll turn the company around. And that's where I think a lot of things, you know, hit the wall, hit the fan, and don't work out for anyone. Um, so there's a lot of roles in data science. That, that's the other problem. Like, who do you get for data science? Like, people talk of roles, and it's not a role. It's a way of thinking. Um, people saw you know, Airbnb and all these, you know, unicorn almost companies seven years ago, seven, eight, ten, uh, when they got started and they saw the data scientists as being these rock stars that like would find value in data and transform the company around. And what they failed to see is how big of a, of a chain of things were happening at the same time in the company and the organization. It wasn't that they hired data scientists is that they hired a whole bunch of people along the road that fall within the data science world. And that's usually the thing that I have to educate a lot. 
In terms of like specific applications, could you speak to what are the specific things or specific applications or problems that you, you guys are tackling? It goes back to this concept that, you know, data science is a, a, a whole system in the company. It's not just one thing. In many ways, it's like, you know, product in a publishing company is not just the PM, right? You have live ops people, you have creative people, you have artists, you have developers that work on Unity, and data science is no different. Um, so data science starts with collecting the data. What events do you have in your game? Like that, that's a, a, a very important part of the business. Uh, how do you store that data? Like, where is it going? Does it make sense the way it's being stored? Will it be usable tomorrow, right? Or is it just being dumped into Amazon or a cloud service provider and hoping no one has to look at it again? Um, what questions to ask the data? <laughs> that, that often is, it was so sad. I remember we were naive 10 years ago, me and Nicholas. And so I wrote this analytics service and I told him, Nicholas, we have real-time analytics. Okay, okay, the game just got launched. Okay, what do you want to ask? I'm ready. I, like switching hats, right? From developer to BI analyst. I was like, <laughs> I'm ready to write some SQL, Nicholas. Tell me what you want. How many players in Japan? It's like, dude, <laughs> that, that's, that's the, the best you could ask. Like <laughs> two months of work and all this, you know, PhD down the tubes. And now we are checking player counts. So it's hard. And I see this all the time in game companies. Like the questions rarely are really well formed or are actionable questions. Um, A-B testing is the other part of data science. That's a whole world of, you know, testing. And it's not just for the game, it's also for uh, creatives uh, in UA, right? And finally, there's data science, as you know. The, the one that people think of data science as the guys who do dynamic pricing, uh, do longer studies on the, the entire game, like LTV projections, uh, ROAS projections, uh, looking into the market to see what games uh, would be good to build next. Um, and that's a whole other subject. But so it's a really broad spectrum, as you can see. Right. Like, if you were to try and categorize the biggest areas, whether it's like, you know, UA relative to you were mentioning some form of concept te testing. I mean, do you even do things like game balancing and things like that? Or like, if you, if you were to categorize how much time you spend with in, on the different problems, and then I assume because it, to your point, it cuts across so many different teams. You're working with all these different teams as well, right? Like, so how are you splitting up your time amongst some of those applications or teams? So I like to split it into in, in two ways. The first one is, it depends on the company, by the way. Like if, you're, if you don't do ad monetization, half of this conversation goes out the window. Or if you don't do marketing for your game because you believe your game is so good that it speaks for itself, power to you, you do that. Uh, so I spent 50% of the time in UA matters. Like, can we, can we do better UA? Can we auto optimize the bids? Uh, do, are we doing the best we can with the services that the networks provide, like, uh, Google proxy events and things like that. Um, so that's 50%. The other 25% are definitely in what data are we collecting and data quality. Um, it takes, depending on the size of the company, the bigger you get, it gets harder is just managing data is a, is a full-time occupation. Um, making sure that we have the synergy in all the data so that we can track a player from ad to attribution through in-game play to churn through the push notification, trying to revive the guy, you know, all of that should be consistent. Um, and then the last bunch of the percentage, the last 25% is, you know, long-term projects. That, that's, I think, what people remember all the time. It's like, ah, he's, he's doing the, the super fancy multi-arm bandit algorithm where it's like <laughs> PhD work, like don't ask, but it's good stuff. It, it makes the company look valuable. Uh, and that's the other 25%. Yeah. And maybe just as another follow-up question, like one of the things you mentioned is like managing the data now, one of the things that I've heard is that data scientists hate cleaning data, but it takes up a lot of time. And so a lot of data science guys get, get kind of lazy about that. Yeah. Like, can you speak to like, why, why, do, why do data science teams have to spend so much time cleaning data or managing data? In your, in your so 
tilting point I, from tilting points experience and i've heard this from other places that it's not that they don't like cleaning up data it's not their job and i and i don't think it's our expertise um because data science is i think often like someone that did a computer science machine learning course and they're interesting in models and making models and, and get doing that part of the chain of events uh there's a whole world of you know devops and uh, making sure the servers are running. And there's the other amazing position of data engineers. Uh, they are the, the stuff that more people should be thinking of. I mean, like they are the, the heroes at the end of the day of getting the data and yeah. cleaning the data. And they do a fantastic okay. job. Like yeah. a tilting point, so I it, see It that. should be their job, basically. <laughs> it's their job. And, and you know what? It hurts to see it the wrong way. I, I was doing interviews uh, this couple of months. And at first, I was trying to find data scientists for this exact purpose that you just said, like right. cleaning up the right. data. And I would tell them upfront, like transparency, right? Like, man, listen, tilting point, you know, well, we have some data to clean still, like we're still working on that. I mean, there's data science projects too, but you might have to clean up data sometimes. And the good ones, the ones that were more veterans in the topic would look at it and be like, wow, not for me, not doing that. <laughs> there was true disappointment in their eyes because all their dreams like just evaporated. Uh, and so I, I realized, like, no, right. you have to hire the right person for the job. Got it. And then you mentioned that you spent you know, half your time on UA. And so just to give our audience kind of a more concrete uh, understanding of what it is that you guys do, could you talk about, like, let's say for UA, what does some of the deliverables look like? So there's a specific problem, and what does that deliverable, what do you guys actually deliver to the UA team? It, it's just if you can think of any specific examples. Oh, there's a ton, a ton. Um, so there's two ways. There's, there's optimization uh, and there is other, other things. So the, there's the optimization route of things. That is things like, can we do better bids, right? And it looks at uh, looking every day at the bids that we're doing at different net networks and optimizing them to be competitive, right? Oftentimes I see that you can overbid on something like, and, and you don't know that like the next person bidding for that target audience, you know, is, is half the amount. Um, and you're completely overshooting and obviously Facebook and, and Google would gladly take your money and, but you don't have to, right. uh, you can get the same <laughs> result for less. Yeah. So it's, it's a basic, you know, optimization. Um, there is projects like Google proxy, which are really fun because Google proxy events, uh, for those that don't know, it's a system where, Google, in order to find you, your audience for your campaigns, they, they try to learn about what is your perfect player based on some criteria, like do they spend money in your game? But that happens very rarely, right? Uh, it, spending money happens like one in a hundred. If you're lucky, a hundred plays you acquire, spend money. So one of the things they allow you to do is send additional events and signals to Google to, to train their algorithm for other things other than just spending money. And one of those things could be the propensity of spending. Okay, this player hasn't spent yet, but it's looking like he will. Like, you just gotta wait, like 74% chance of spending. Um, and that can make a real big difference because it makes Google learn faster about your target audience. Right. Uh, so this starting... is basically just trying to find, you know, kind of upstream events that will yeah. be very, you know, highly correlated or yeah. potentially can predict a purchase event, essentially. Exactly. It can be okay. things as dumb as, you know, do they finish the tutorial? Right. You know, uh, right. do they come back, you know, five sessions in a row or how many days have they played? You know, these are all weak indicators. Right. And what's really sexy about this is that there's a lot of synergy between this kind of project with a lot of other projects you might want to do because prediction is really powerful. And we can talk about that in another part, but so predicting, you know, that if they will spend or how willing they are to spend is can impact live ops and targeting of promotions and et cetera. Um, and then the other part in that I spent a lot of time thinking about is can we do better ads? Because one of the easiest ways to improve uh, your UA spend is having a better ad. Obviously, you can't just be chasing the the mythical ad that has, you know, a, a ridiculous click-through rate. Uh, but you can learn, you know, you can learn about whether you should be using a green button that says download now versus the red button that says free now. Uh, 
um, you can learn about character choices. Um, some countries have preferences for a specific character in the game. And with data, you can actually see that and you can help artists make better decisions about ads and creatives. And just so our audience can kind of understand what potential impact data science can have, could you talk about what kind of deltas you've seen? So whether it's, you know, in bidding or finding proxy events uh, for Google, but, you know, how, what kind of a performance improvement or a cost improvement yeah. are, are you generally able to, to drive using, you know, whatever data science methodologies you guys are using? Yeah, so UA has a lot of variability. Sometimes nothing happens and sometimes you see great results. Um, and partially I attribute that to the fact that you're optimizing already a machine learning algorithm that is a complete black box. And in some ways they would rather you not optimize it at all, right? Because they're doing the business for you of optimizing it. Uh, so it varies it. You can see, for instance, like in the bidding example, like you can see uh, halving you know, the bid or improving by twice your spend. Uh, just by tweaking the bids. Uh, Google Proxy, same thing. You can easily have a 20% uplift in your campaign if you have the right events uh, and if you have the right prediction model, you can see a bump there. Um, the And by the way, I always like to be super conservative because there's nothing worse than like over-promising because that's the other downfall of data science is that for years we've been like, oh, 5X, 100% uplift. And, and it doesn't do anyone good. Uh, it, 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 it inflates the whole thing to a degree that can't be met. Um, and for product, you know, we're looking a little less. Uh, it's more consistent. Like, so, you know, uh, in-game offer optimization, dynamic pricing, uh, what offer to show a player, how many ads to show in a session. You know, those you're looking at, you know, 10 to 20% uplifts, but they're much more consistent. They don't vary as much. Okay, great. And then in terms of the team itself, how are data science teams typically structured? And maybe you could talk about if there are different kinds, of, you know, whether it's by game or whether there's a data science team that, you know, is organized around applications. How do you think about organizing your data science team and how, yeah. how do you figure out how many data science scientists that you need and what, what are the typical types of things that they're doing? Yeah. So this varies a lot based on what business you're running, right? It bases off of, are you a game developer or are you a game publisher? Uh, do you have, is it one game that you're, you, you, you're putting all your eggs into or do you, are you distributing it across a, a, a whole library? Um, and, and oftentimes like, and as I said, data science is a collection of different roles. Um, data science just being one of them. And so if we talk about like the, the game developer route, right, um, you don't actually need data science necessarily. I'll say that. Um, you, you can do great things with less. And what you need is, you know, good control of the data um, and someone that is eager to exploit the data for profit, essentially. It's someone that sees an opportunity in, in the game and says, wait, um, you know, why do we show always the $7.99 offer when the game starts? Like, we know the attribution of the player. We know that they've been acquired for $10. Like, the CPI was 10 Like, why are we showing $10 here? Or vice versa, why are we showing the $10 offer for an organic player? Like, this guy doesn't even know what the game is about, and we're already, like, trying to make him into a whale. Um, and so there, you know, it's not necessarily data scientist. Um, it could be a data engineer with an with a interest in that. I've seen physicists with it doing that, too. Um, it, it's, it's more about having a strong base, a strong foundation in controlling the data, and having, having then one or two people to exploit the data. If you're a game publisher, stuff changes a lot, though. For a publisher, you really have to work this, there's this, this thing called the pyramid, a, a data science pyramid. That's like how it's usually conveyed nowadays. And it, it's, it's basically from the, ba the foundation being ingestion of the data, going through cleaning up the data, analytics, A-B testing, data science. Um, and so for when you're talking about that, uh, 
pyramid is a nice uh, way to think about it because it also kind of represents how many people you need. So if you, it basically it's like almost double per layer. <laughs> Uh, that's what I've seen at Tilting Point working out, and, and I would see this growing. Um, if you have one data scientist, you probably need two BI analysts. If you have two BI analysts, you probably need four or five data engineers. Um, that's just, uh, you know, it, it just multiplies itself. Um, and it's, it takes more commitment. It definitely takes commitment to do that because you have to hire a lot of people to, to start the engine. So let's say you're you're a small game studio, you've got one game product. And so for that kind of a team, what would you would you suggest they not have a data science team initially? Or and if, if you were to get a data science uh some type of data science team or one data scientist or like yeah. what kind of a team would you hire and when if you're like a new game studio just kind of starting yeah. out, gonna launch a game? So if I'm about to launch a game and I need, I, and I believe that there's like pillars of revenue and one of them is data science. I think it's the best thing you can do is, is get someone that is as close to a full stack engineer as possible, to be honest. Someone that is not afraid to clean up the data, someone that is not afraid to do data engineering, do DevOps, someone that's not afraid to look at data and graphs and, and find the, because here's the thing, even if you were a data scientist, right? This is the, what I keep doing most of the time is even if I find something that makes sense, such as what offer to show. Now you have the whole problem of how do you get that into the game? Like, and this is where full stackness comes in. You have to have the know-how of how do games work? Are you using right. Lean Plum or Swerve or Delta DNA? Like, how are you gonna push that knowledge to have an impact? So when you hire someone that's very focused, it, it, like in a small studio, you risk the the likely problem that they're too focused and they will hit ro like walls all the time of like, ah oh, man, I don't know Unity, you know, or oh live ops, I I don't do live ops, I I just do I just do models and machine learning. So you have to think broader. But is it, it, wouldn't that kind of person be pretty rare? Somebody that knows the data science, but can also, you know, it has a C-sharp unity and Python yeah. and like all Super that. rare, super <laughs> rare, but they happen, they happen. I, okay. I just spent my last six months doing this kind of work and uh, you have to keep looking. There are eager, uh, talented engineers out there. They're not that rare. You can spot them in, like pretty easily after you say hi to them, you know, okay, this guy, this guy just likes tech and is passionate about technology they're not focused like in right and then it, as far as the data science that part of their background is concerned what would you be looking for i mean is it you know someone who's just taking a random data science class in college or are you looking for a phd yeah. or you know like yeah like how much how much before they're dangerous <laughs> well that's the thing I, I i hate to do this but it's like i don't i'm being real here and i don't want to like sure. set these ridiculous expectations you know like <laughs> oh man you need a phd and uh better have a data science degree because those things don't really exist um okay and not really and they're very new and data science without experience is also not particularly the best bang for the buck if you're you know a small studio with a game because you have to learn on the job and it, it's part of the, the, that's part of the role. So the, the best people, like if you're looking for data science, like if you, cause it's probably easiest. Um, it's someone that has done actionable things. Uh, that's what I would say. I would focus on actionable. It's, it, it doesn't matter if their project was, uh, you know, finding the best, best time to call an Uber for, for JFK. And that's, that was their, you know, hackathon project. And they, they actually show that, you know, if you do it at 546, that's the best time to press the button versus, you know, five minutes before or five minutes later. That's the guy you want. You want someone that just likes to do things and always is producing actionable stuff. Um, as far as their degree, I am biased to computer science. That's just my background personally. So there's a certain amount of knowledge that comes from going through the, the motions of a four-year program. It, it makes you think of problems differently, uh, but that's 
I'm surprised all the time without computer science degrees. Uh, so it doesn't, it's not a requirement. And maybe just going back to that new studio, like the, the game startup situation, yeah. if we can't find that Uber data science programmer, DevOps, yeah. blah, blah, blah type of guy, yeah. what should we expect in terms of like, for a more traditional type of scenario, like how much of a budget, how many people would you think is, you know, kind of a practical rough range in order to start building applications? Uh, I mean, data science. yeah, I mean, I don't want to be a lawyer here, right? Also be like, well, it depends, but I have to say <laughs> one thing. What the biggest factor I consider when, when thinking of these roles is how long do you want to live with the product that they generate? And how long is this game going to last? Uh, if your game is, if, it, if it's a game that has a, a license with a special IP and it's, you know, sunsetting after a year anyways, because you didn't pay for the extension or, you know, the extension will be ridiculous, that means you only have a year to, to live with the, the work they produce. If, if it's a game that you're hoping will be, you know, a chain of games or it's like, this is the thing, then things change a lot. So to your question, right, um, short-term game hyper casual, you know, for hire, I don't know, something like that. You know, you can do something with much less. I would say, you know, 70K data engineer. I would focus on data engineers, to be honest, uh, because they actually don't complain when they go into data science. They actually (laughs) see that as an opportunity to learn something new and improve their resume. But the other way around, not so good. Data scientists doing data engineering, they always feel like it's a one step down. So you want to start there, and and yeah, the the you know the, it doesn't have to be a rock star because uh, it's only a year. Who you know, as long as the data was dumped somewhere, it's cool. And as long as there's movement in the the product, it's fine. And you have a team of two or three engineers, and it'll be peachy. If if this thing is for a long like a long haul, like you're gonna build on this game, and you have a, a two year you know, roadmap already of features and PVP modes to be made. Uh, you can't, you, you can't, you can't go, you can't cut corners. That's, you should never cut corners. The decisions early on that you make and the decisions the engineers will make by themselves, because they will happen, right? They will make decisions yeah. on their own, especially at the beginning of a team. They will have profound, like, directional changes two years down the road that are... Right that are very painful. And I would, never, I would never sacrifice the salary for the team. So yes, you probably need seven people to operate this thing, the data science team. But if you don't have that budget, I would start from the bottom and move up. So I would still get the best, the best you can possibly get, you know, data engineer or DevOps person. I would still get the best BI person in the world. And if, if the budget doesn't get to data science, it, you run short, just wait a year. It, it's fine because the quality of the data will allow, at the very least, it will allow the executives to access the data and they will be able to make something out of it. Because I've seen so often, you know, UA managers who opened the raw data in Excel, a couple pivot tables, a couple graphs, you know, they love this stuff too. Like they do all the shortcut keys in Excel. And, and they do all the bidding optimization by hand and pe- like paper and pencil style every morning at 9 a.m. That's fine. That will produce the revenue to hire the data scientists later. Got it. So I thought we could now talk about mistakes. I mean, you know, everybody's got mistakes. And I would imagine just because the role of data science is often mi- misunderstood within a lot of organizations and game studios, wanted to ask you what some of the biggest mistakes you've seen are in working with data science teams, but maybe I can also preface this with just my own experience, which is that, you know, and kind of to your point about how early decisions kind of impact your data science team. So one of the things that I've seen is that, that like some of the biggest mistakes were just setting the mission of the data science team and hiring that right initial lead. And, and so What I've seen at times is just like data science kind of gone wild where, you know, we've got these guys and it's really more about like these really esoteric, weird problems that have nothing to do with the business case. Right. And so they're out chasing windmills 
And it's yeah. like, guys, we, we got a business here. I don't know what you guys are doing. So, exactly. I, so given that, it would be great to kind of hear your opinion and uh, may, maybe your own thoughts on that kind of a, that kind of a situation. Yeah, no, the, the PhD is running, you know, going crazy, uh, going wild in their own department and their own floor, right? Because the, the other thing about PhDs <laughs> is that you don't want to have them like with the other people. Like you're, you're going to like separate floor, they do the crazy stuff. You visit once a month maybe and uh, you get a sense of what they're doing. That's a common case. That's a common case of if you have funding too, because that's not cheap. Um, that, yeah. that comes with a very high cost. <laughs> yeah. And usually what that means is like, you got some cash to burn and good for you. Because at the end of the day, when you hire a, a, a very large pool of PhD talent, first of all, there's great work that they do for themselves. Like the value that they're generating for their academic life is, is, is pure gold. Because gaming has the most amount of data, and the most interesting kind of data out there. So, you know, it's great that that, that role exists, but it's hard to direct them into the real world, very hard. It takes a very special person to, to focus PhDs to, to real life problems. And by the way, PhD, like this whole idea of a PhD in, in the company makes for great, uh, it's a value of the company based on the hires you've made, right? It is not transferable, uh, which is kind of sad because that, that was probably the idea was that we'll hire PhDs to create value, tech value, right? So that you can sell the company off or be acquired but it turns out that there's very little. As far as like mistakes I see a lot, there's a couple. So like the first one that we just talked about earlier is the budget business. PA, data science is inflated in salaries across the board. I mean, it's in the US inflated, it's in New York inflated. You go to Ukraine, it's inflated. Uh, and you're talking about 20% inflation at least. So it's very likely that you go out looking for a hire that you think is, you know, oh, I'm paying 70K, like, should be decent, like, you know, not, not complete junior, not out of school yesterday. And it turns out that that not necessarily the case. You, you can go really far with data science uh, without having that experience and you're still paying a large amount. And that's why I, I say, always go back to this concept of like, you don't necessarily need data science. You need someone that gets the job done. Because also like the uplifts I mentioned earlier, they don't require a PhD. They're not, PhD level optimizations. So we're not doing deep learning, you know, genetic algorithms with, uh, you know, TensorFlow. It's just basic optimizations. The other mistake I see a lot, and this is actually the one I, I'm more passionate about because this is what I really learned from Gondola. And I see it happening all the time and it hurts because it's hard to communicate, especially with data scientists, is that they have to run with small projects in mind. You can't, data science in a company is not a, is not a long-term sabbatical project of 12 months where you, you sail out into, into the, the void and you hope to find a 2x improvement in LTV predictions. Within that year, nothing happens. Because what happens every time, and we did this at Gondola all the time, I did it, is you become further and further away from your, cons your customer. And by the time you, you find uh, the, the optimization you're looking for or the model that delivers, you might have totally missed the mark on what they wanted. And then what do you do, right? I mean, that, that kind of happened with, with dynamic pricing um, because you can have the best dynamic pricing solution. It doesn't mean that every game is suitable for it. Like if it's a PVP game, won't my players talk up to each other? Like, is it fair to have two players with different prices, right? That happens when you go to the PhD route of studying a lot and not talking to people. The other mistake that happens from the same purpose is that easily nine out of 10, the project fails, like catastrophically. It's like, not good. Like, oh, we are doing this uh, project uh, optimization model. And uh, yeah, yeah. Not good, 50-50, best, best uh, accuracy is 50% accurate or less. Like, I just don't know, I don't know what to do. And, and it hurts a lot and it hurts morale uh, for the engineer um, because they, they're suddenly looking at their you know, end of year review and they're like, gosh, all I have to show is this horrible model that failed. And on the other side, 
it, it hurts the the company because they're like, what are these guys doing? Like, is it are they just bad or did we do something wrong? Uh, is it that hard? Why is it so hard? Uber does it. Like that's also what happens. Like Uber does it. Well, how hard could it be? Um, so what I the way to solve that and I keep trying to do that all the time is fail fast, fail fast. Like how can we get this model or this data science project to fail within I don't know a month. Month is already too long. I want to like if this is going to fail, it fails usually really fast. It's not something that takes a long time to fail, and it's fine. Fail, it's good. It's good. It saves everyone a lot of grief and uh, it moves us forward. And so, last question I have is really about where the future of like data science or whether it's applications, team, team structure, that kind yeah. of thing, where the market is headed. And certainly, you know, you're talking about a lot of changes that happen. And just as a specific example, we have Facebook's new, their updated data use terms for mobile app measurement, not yeah. being able to get like device user level data back and things like that. But just given how dynamic the industry is and things like that, just wanted to get your current sense of given all these changes happening, where, where, where are we headed? Yeah, I mean, data science has changed a lot. When I started, right, real-time analytics was the thing. And uh, that's all everyone did. Then there was A-B testing craze. Everyone just did A-B tests and data scientists were part of that business. Uh, then we moved on, right? Like we know we don't talk about A-B testing. We that's that's live ops people talk now, right? Uh, we don't touch that. I, I touch multi-arm bandit testing now. Maybe maybe in five years I won't touch that either, right? Things change. And so the first part is of the industry is is letting go. You gotta keep letting go of, of things as they become commodities. Um uh, Real-time analytics is nice. Controlling the events you're sending is nice, but at some point you got to let go. There's people like Amplitude that do a fantastic job. You don't need to do that. As the, the industry matures, I see that it's all about the end-to-end -end player journey optimization. That is the new holy grail. It was always somewhat of a holy grail since the beginning because we could sense the, the fact that there was a continuous link of data from creating the ad to doing the UA through the player starting playing the game, the first, you know, Fatui experience through the full life cycle, they churn, you try to revive them, you show them ads, like there's a whole chain of events and getting that under control is I think the new playing field that no one has control over yet. Uh, there's no service that can do it yet. There is, it's something that requires a lot of, orchestration and that's where i think the the good companies will show up and will pop up in is the companies that can do this from end to end as far as you know and then that goes into like well how do you change it right uh, how do you get to that point of having this end-to-end -end optimization of the player journey and that's tricky i often think that from tilting points perspective you know data science has to be in every department to get this done right Right? Because even business development, the people that bring the game into a publishing company, yeah. there is data science to be made there. Like, what games are you looking at? What, who are you targeting? Uh, getting the games that make most sense to the company so that you can publish it successfully. Data science there too. And so in some ways, I often have this dream that you know, maybe data science should be something where it's distributed across the whole organization and have you know, people specialized in finding these opportunities in their data and bubbling it up. But it's hard. It's hard to get them to, to work like that. It doesn't make sense unless you're a very large company. And what happens at the end of the day, I think, is that you, you just have to be moving around and you have to consistently move around and find the, where the next bottleneck is. Because that's ultimately what data science is about is, you know, if you, you look at the chain, I mean, that's what I do at Tilting Point. I look at this full end-to-end -end chain and I find the next broken link that is the biggest broken link and you try to retool it. Try to like fix it somehow, make the data go from BD to UA. Okay, okay, we got that link down. Okay, let's find another problem. Oh, it's a AB testing data now going through the MailChimp emailer. Okay, let's figure that out now and keep doing that all the time. It's a full-time job. Cool, so that was basically my last question. And so like maybe for our audience, do you have any, any message for our, our audience or is there any way that people who might be interested in contacting you, could I leave a, a link to your LinkedIn or something like that or email or something? 
Uh, sure. I mean, the best way to, I'm old school, very old school. The best way is andre.cohen at Gmail uh, <laughs> nice. or LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> LinkedIn, I, I do that too. Yeah. Last words is I think is data science is a, is a fascinating topic that requires you to be very realistic. If you're realistic, things can really happen and you should, you should focus on, on the people. It's about the people that you work with. It's not about their degrees or their passions necessarily, because that's where things go wrong. Um, it's really about their, their, their character and what they're interested in working in. That makes a difference. Cool. All right, Andre, thank you very much for your time. And that's the wrap. Thank you very no. much, Andre. Thank you, Joe. Nice talking to you. Okay.